The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. With the second of my two lectures kicking off the 2023 Orchestration Challenge Evaluation Sessions. Hopefully you're all up to date since the announcement back in late July, and perhaps you also participated this year, and you're waiting for your evaluation to be released. Stand by, because the first set of website subscriber evaluations is going to drop tomorrow. But one way or another, I hope you've already viewed part one of these lectures, in which I went over my orchestration of the first movement of Beethoven's 24th Piano Sonata in a great amount of detail. This lecture won't run quite so long as the previous one, but the challenges are no less intense. Before we jump into the problems of transcription, I wanted to touch on the key of F-sharp major. I've already outlined the serious difficulties any orchestra might face playing a version of this sonata in its original key intonation, fingering, natural horn tuning, and so on, in my Pitfalls video, which I hope all my participants have viewed by now. It's an opinion shared by many orchestration teachers, and is stated most eloquently by Gordon Jacob in his book Orchestral Technique. But none of this is intended as a wholesale condemnation of F-sharp major under any circumstances. 
For a keyboardist, it's a beautiful key in which to play, along with its enharmonic equivalent of G flat major. Many legendary works have been written for piano and harp with this landscape. Speaking as a retired piano and harpsichord recitalist and accompanist, there's something beautiful about navigating from a home key that sits mostly on the black keys, whether one is playing this sonata, or the two interrelated F-sharp harpsichord sonatas of Scarlatti, or even Bach's Prelude No. 8 from the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, in the enharmonic relative minor of E-flat. I find that the more black keys I play, the less I need my eyes to check on where my fingers are. And, of course, for harp, six flats is a great key for the resonant length of relaxed strings. I occasionally score six sharps or flats orchestrally, usually in the case of modulating up a half step from F in a crossover score on request from a client. This is never an issue for my players, who just take it in stride, usually on their way up yet another half step to G the next time through the chorus. It's just that this intense, fast-paced piano writing is not the greatest match to an orchestral interpretation in F-sharp, especially not when scored emulating the style and era of its own composer. As to this section of Beethoven's 24th Piano Sonata, the wildly exuberant second movement rondo, a lot of the features that make it so natural to play as a pianist become special areas of concern for the orchestrator, whether the music is transposed to a more accessible key or not. At the same time, I don't think that there's a need to break down the source piano score page by page, episode by episode, like I did with the longer, more developed first movement. So let's just touch on the general concerns, which I'll leave as a chart at the beginning of my evaluations of those participants who chose to score this movement. The first concern is, of course, <laughs> the setting of the rondo's main theme which appears four times. The challenge will be the same each time this material comes around. Do the contrasts of dynamics, and registers in some cases, imply a contrast of texture, not just with choice of instruments, but with density of tone weight? Will the orchestrator vary these contrasts with different scoring at each return to the rondo theme, exploring a natural overall progression of drama and scope, not to mention avoiding too much repetition? and at the pianissimo in each iteration. Pianists tend to pull back a bit in both force and tempo. So is that also a feature worth carrying over into the orchestral version? Each of these statements, except for the last one, is followed by the harem scarum scrambling slurred pairs of sixteenths over a flowing descending bass line, played through twice, leading back to the one chord the first time, and then ending in an alternate direction the second time, setting up the paired tuplets, which we'll talk about in a little while. But let's stick with this part for the moment, which contains several challenges within it naturally building and expanding the music texturally and dynamically as the hands grow farther apart, making the repeat feel inevitable rather than just a replay, bringing the phrase to an end with suitable finality that frames the entrance of the following material, and interpreting the slurred tuplets in a way that removes the broken, limping awkwardness or needless fussiness that might result from a direct transcription. I'd assume most orchestrators would want to reinforce the nervous energy here instead of working against it, and I look forward to seeing everyone else's strategies. Let's 
Let's jump ahead to two parallel sections that arpeggiate upwards with the same slurred tuplet approach. The first in D-sharp major, alternating with D-sharp minor. The second, essentially a direct transposition of the first, up a minor third to F-sharp major, alternating with F-sharp minor. Each of these statements end with developments based on the sections we just looked at previously, with the same nervous energy and furious expansion, ending in jolting surprise chords. So we face some of the same challenges as before in setting the slurred tuplets overall without sounding too rushed and affected, maintaining the nervous energy, building up textures while the functions expand in either hand, and avoiding too much repetition in favor of a natural momentum. There's also some natural range limits built into orchestral instruments that make setting those upward swooping arpeggios a matter of trading from instrument to instrument as they ascend, not to mention maintaining the energy and excitement texturally and perhaps rhythmically, instead of all those notes just climbing up to the top following the source score. I love these little worrying bars of tonic minor following each grand arpeggio, as if Beethoven has to return to his nervous doubts every time he makes a majestic pronouncement. Now you see the method to my meandering. All of the sections we just discussed, the scrambling pairs of tuplets and the upward ripping arpeggios, etc., are followed the same way by little individual tuplets thrown from hand to hand, skipping up and down the keyboard. This is the connective tissue of the movement, and to my mind some of the trickiest passages to score effectively. A direct transcription especially at the same customary tempo of Allegro Vivace, will prove incredibly hard to rehearse and perform if one orchestral player is constantly following the next with no connection to each other, one of them always coming in after the beat. The more intense this scoring, the more precision will be needed for an effective interpretation. One of the reasons why transposing your orchestration to more negotiable keys is so important. And that's just the start of it. What relation does the choice of instruments in the linear texture have to this passage's position in the structure of the movement? Will the dynamics likewise affect the choice of instruments, or the direction of the line up or down? How does the material lead back to each new episode, whether back to the main theme or to the furious arpeggios? If different sections of the orchestra play back and forth upon one another, does that support lightning-fast precision and clarity? And there's yet even another concern. Most pianists get in and out of these sections with a little pause, sometimes as much as a full beat long, to help define the dramatic shape of the phrasing. Is that pause something worth preserving in your adaptation? That simply leaves the tail end of the rondo, after the fourth and final restatement of the main theme, in which Beethoven develops the little answering gesture after the pianissimo into an elegant, dignified section of its own, slowly climbing upward a couple of octaves, until finally settling on some pensive harmonies. A rippling five-chord arpeggio bar in free time, and then the coup de grace bringing things to a rippling close. All of these individual little gestures and phrases each interdependently pose their own problems. 
how to build forward in the development while maintaining the graceful poise of the phrasing and cooler colors of the pianissimo dynamic and harmony, expanding with natural emphasis to these sforzando high seas, not getting too hot, which might rob the end of the coda of its impact. Then, how to manage this wonderful little cool down, the higher phrases echoed again an octave lower, finally settling on the fermata chords. How do we get the orchestra to convey that feeling of Beethoven thinking to himself, pondering the whole form of this masterpiece, before unleashing the final hurricane of notes? My participants who will be scoring this movement will notice that I stretch the little arpeggiando cadenza across two proper measured bars to make it easier to time for the players, not to mention synchronize for the conductor. But do we even need to ripple across arpeggios like Beethoven here? Is it worth it to throw in harp in this movement, which Beethoven barely used, just to adapt those arpeggios realistically for two bars? Is there any way to do this convincingly with other instruments, while maintaining the feeling of crescendo and thickening texture that we'd hear in piano pedaling? Or can these bars be simplified so that the arpeggios really don't play much of a role at all? Finally, can the end of the coda be orchestrated in a way that wraps up all previous treatments without feeling too repetitive or trite? And that's, in some ways, just an overview. Beethoven, in his orchestrations, usually revisits his themes with new textural approaches, finding new colors and emotional meanings, even when he approaches note-for-note -note copy-pasting in some recurring sections. It goes back to the natural flow of the material, and its context within the developing form, and its connection to the sections that follow and precede it. And then there's just the imagination of the orchestrator and the need to tinker. The more that the adaptation appears to evolve from one phrase to the next, the more natural it will flow for the listener. Now that I've defined all of my evaluation criteria, let's turn them back onto my orchestration of this movement and apply them to each sequential section as they were assigned to different Patreon support levels. Here on this first screen, you can see that I've carried over the same instrumentation from the previous movement. Double winds, two pairs of natural horns in F and C basso, and strings. But added a set of three trombones and timpani. Notice that I score alto and tenor on one staff, mostly just to save vertical space, and that they share an alto clef, as customary in such 19th century pairings in full score. The bass trombones back in Beethoven's day had longer bores tuned to F, unlike today's bass models which are essentially B-flat instruments like tenors, with wider bores plus triggers opening extra low tubing. For my timpani, I score a part that's obviously intended for four tunable kettles, rather than a fixed pair as Beethoven would have used. That allows for a more variable use of the instrument, and saves a few problems which allow the timpani to be used to greater effect. Nevertheless, I still use alternate pitches for convenience in places, rather than always retuning to the root. In fact, I only ask for a single retuning of the third kettle's G up to A, and then back. Otherwise, the pitches are set as you see them here, from bottom to top, F, G, B flat, and C. For the first statement of the Rondo theme, I've chosen to go further than just interpreting alternating dynamic levels as changes in texture and scope. I've actually imposed a wider sound picture onto the forte bars, which in turn makes the softer intervening bars all the more subtle and graceful. The first bar and a half is scored simply enough, stacking the source piano's right hand notes onto flutes and violins above, clarinets first and third horns, and violas below. The left hand notes are transcribed directly onto bassoons, fourth horn, and divisi cellos, with double basses doubling at the octave below. 
Notice that I've intensified the contribution of the upper strings by having them hammer away at sixteenth notes, rather than just play the same rhythmic durations as the flutes. The approach for the next forte bar and a half repeats these positions and strategies. Flutes and hammering strings stacked over clarinets and both F horns now, all ascending with the harmonized melody in contrary motion to bassoons, C basso horns, cellos, and lower strings. Notice that the C basso horns and cellos double each other this time, while the bassoons play octaves doubling the lower divisi cellos and double basses. But what about the softer alternating bars? Since Beethoven scores these little answering motives about an octave apart in the piano score, I've chosen to use two different approaches. First with trombones doubled by lower strings, with pizzicato basses tracking the lower divisi cellos at an octave below. It's great to bring in the trombones right away, answering the first tutti bar with a soft but rich tone. Then for the second alternating motive, I've chosen a textural approach taking that rich sound in a more intimate direction, with a note-for-note -note transcription to all double reed instruments, plus a pizzicato lower string bass line. In both cases, I've added a little reinforcement to the pizzicato basses with a touch of timpani, something I admit is a little out of character for Beethoven, but it fits the energy of the music very well here at the start. Then I've acknowledged the tendency of pianists to hold back a little at bars 9 and 10 with a momentary drop in tempo down to a meno, picking up speed again at bar 11 into the next phrase. I've matched that flex in tempo with a bit of restraint in the scoring solo clarinet over violas and cellos, a breath of placid calm, which still contains the textural potential to push forward vigorously at the tempo primo. And now, how to orchestrate those scrambling tuplets over a smooth walking bass line. Let's start with the bass line, a simple note-for-note -note transcription in cellos and bassoons. But notice the nuances of articulation and phrasing, giving a little push of emphasis here and there, while still providing a smoother line that's easy to divide into down and up bows. And then establishing a more punctuated foundation to the orchestra by going into staccato, doubled at the octave by the basses. The second time through is basically the same, Except notice how reinforcing the lower notes of the cellos in bar 20 positions the basses at the octave in bar 21, for a triple octave when the bassoons, timpani, and lower trombones are added. The tuplets take a little more explaining, as I've exploded a lot of their inherent function across the orchestra in different approaches and positions. First and second violins start with a transcription at the beginning, but then divide up harmonic support and energy. The firsts hammering at the upper pitches in measured tremolo sixteenths, and the seconds covering the lower pitches in mezzo staccato. Violas provide some harmonic filling in under the seconds, intertwining with the internal line of first clarinet. Notice the Beethoven touch in bars 14 and 16, with winds reinforcing both melody and harmony at the forte, for added color more than dynamic strength, which I've kept to mezzo forte. Then, Following my evaluation criteria's request for more than just a replay from bar 16, I've developed the orchestration a little, with some offbeat mezzo staccato in the first violins leading to an interlocking pattern with the seconds. When the winds return to the reinforcing role, I add the natural horns, all properly open pitches except for a couple of half-stopped high Fs at the start, but all in mezzo forte until the big push at the end, where I add a bit of motion to the viola part against the trombones and horns. Before I turn the page, notice the time signature change to 3-4 on the final incomplete bar. This literally translates the tendency of pianists to hang on to that chord for a full beat rather than just the eighth note in the piano score, and then leave a gap before proceeding into the section of flighty trading off tuplets from hand to hand. I also introduce an extended bar to the end of this passage, just before the restatement of the rondo theme, to add the psychological gap that pianists give both themselves and their listeners. 
then the trading off occurs between interlocking patterns rather than isolated tuplets, with first and second violins, in which each string group plays on the beat so as not to get lost. This may not seem all that intriguing, but imagine this performed in the old-style stage positions, with the firsts on the left of the conductor and the seconds to the right. The patterns would appear to dance back and forth between the audience's ears. If the violas are centered or slightly to the left behind the first violins, and the cellos on the right behind the second violins, something similar will occur when the pattern dives down into their parts at the end. Let's play through all three of these screens in a row now, tracking the overall character of this first episode of Rondo. My plan here was to give the strings, and especially the first violins, their due emphasis as the central focus in early 19th century orchestration, while using winds, brass, and percussion for strengthening, contrast, and the occasional solo, and to do it all in such a way that further developments of, and deviations away from, this approach would be coming from a place of easy reference for the listener. With all that firmly in your mind, let's turn to the second iteration of the Rondo theme. In the piano score, as we heard at the beginning of the lecture, the music is essentially identical. But, as I noted just now, I started with a powerfully string-centered approach. So here's an opportunity to immediately contrast that in the restatement, taking full advantage of my rich natural horns and blustery trombones which admittedly are nowhere near their actual color and impact in the mock-up. I've also added some lower winds to firm up the color and clarity of line. The alto trombone part will be particularly effective here, with its clear clarion-like color, essentially obviating any need for a trumpet part in this approach, though I keep it off that high sounding E-flat at the end of that second blast. The natural horns will have a few stop notes here and there, Nothing too out of the ordinary for players used to popping out the occasional high Fs and E flats, while the aggregate of combined brass and wind tones will cover over any individual snarliness of timbre. Each of these forte declamations is answered by an apologetic affirmation in mezzo forte strings, feeling like half the strength in contrast to the bluster. This scoring is more or less a direct transcription, with a little filling in here and there by violas and octave doubling of cellos with basses, plus the same discrete timpani punctuation as before. Then the two apposite sections and functions are reconciled with a calm high F-horn solo over low strings, setting up the return to the chase on the next page. This next screen doesn't need an enormous amount of explanation, as it's pretty much the same as before from bar 12, with a few alterations at the end as the music goes in a different harmonic direction. There's a retuning, as I mentioned before, of the G kettle to A, which will be used as an anchor in a couple of passages coming up. A few stopped pitches in the natural horns fit into the mixed character of the last two chords, more snarly than usual, especially with the introduction of straight mutes onto the alto and tenor trombones. Notice that once again, I've added an extra beat to the bar going into a trading off tuplet section, but not going out as I've noticed that pianists usually opt to dive straight into the downbeat of the beginning of the next section from this passage, and with good reason considering the momentum. I've kept the scoring to the violas and cellos, picking up from where they left off before, but adding a sinister push from muted trombones, alto at first, then tenor, and finally, 
first bassoon with a more mellow timbre, evening out the harsh edge of the brass. These little commentaries are all on the beat, so they shouldn't be too hard to nail for the players dropping in on the strings like this. Which takes us right into the first of the arpeggiating upward sections, which I feel have superb potential for an orchestral treatment. There are three main challenges here, keeping the rising tuplets on track, or at least well supported, compensating for strength and fullness of register as the line rises through the range of different instruments, and building a cohesive texture out of the upward motion. So here are my solutions in that order. I drop the right hand piano part right onto the first violins, slurs and all, adding an easy double stop sixth on the accent at the end. Especially with the push and the energy from that crescendo mark, the slurs will come off as furious rather than affected. This is doubled by clarinets in an interlocking pattern from upper chalumeau to lower clarino registers, trading off to flutes in the perfect transitional spot at the top of the treble staff. Meanwhile, the first note of each tuplet is underlined in staccato by the second violins. That covers most of the first two concerns. Then, as to building a texture out of the rising line, I start with a dark, full unison on that accented low D in second bassoon, bass trombone, and double basses, with first bassoon adding an octave above to reinforce the resonance. Here we also have a timpani stroke on the complementary pitch of A. No need to always hit the root in a Beethoven orchestration. Dancing upward from this drone, the left-hand part is dropped onto staccato cellos, which dovetail into violas carrying the line most of the way upward, as scored in the source, but ending in a nice double-stop sixth, while those cellos drop and double from a much more negotiable octave below. Each pitch of this upward dance is in turn doubled and sustained by a member of the brass section, the last two pitches doubled by oboes, and then punched by everybody on the following downbeat. I intentionally scale down the little worrying tonic minor response to interlocking clarinets and smoothly slurred bassoons, maintaining the incisive quality while reducing the emotional scope, just like the piano score. Even going forward, I keep this smaller scale in the lower winds, with just a touch of bass doubling on the bassoons then contrast the motive with a powerful response in the string section. The second violins take the lower pitches of the tuplets, as before, with the violas filling in harmonically below, and the first playing rapid-fire staccato above. And of course I keep the bassoons in the game to help fill out the lower strings. Then in the remaining bars, I put everything together, measured tremolo strings creeping up under the return of lower winds and basses, pushing into a replay of the same scoring from bar 66, plus added winds and brass for both color and strength this time. I was happy with how many open pitches I was able to keep in the natural horn parts, with those sharps on the tutti chord doubled and evened out by the alto and tenor trombones. Notice that I've respelt the G-flat 7th chord as F-sharp 7th in most instruments for better intonation, leaving in a few B-flats here and there just for ease of playing and reading. The timpani stroke on the B-flat provides one of those alternate notes in which retuning to the root is once again not needed. And here at the end of the page, I don't bother extending the bar by adding a beat to make 3-4 time, as Beethoven has already scored a built-in pause, but I do flesh out the eighth note tutti chord to a full quarter note value. But, as you can see on this next screen, I add a beat at the end of the passage to reflect the little pause that most pianists insert before jumping into the third appearance of the Rondo theme. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. First, let's look at the contrast here with my previous string-focused interpretations of the alternating tuplets, this time scored more flowingly in winds, taking a full beat's worth of pitches before trading off to another instrument. I've kept each snippet in a choice register for each successive instrument, 
tenor register first bassoon, followed by chalamo first clarinet, low register first oboe, lower clarino clarinet, middle register oboe, middle register first flute, higher clarino clarinet, and then a little interplay between high register flute and oboe from there. At bar 81, when the pitch drops, I interlock clarinet with flute, becoming ever more silvery as the dynamic softens down to pianissimo. From bar 85, I ease up on the interlocking pattern and take a chance on fully independent parts by the end of the passage, but sticking to my own guideline of not doing this for more than two or three bars. The more independent, the more isolated and whimsical each separated part becomes. So there's a benefit in having intertwined the lines beforehand as a way of setting up this eventual starkness and apparent randomness of function. Which takes us to about halfway through the rondo. Beethoven has said pretty much all he's going to say, plus a few added tweaks, so now he's going to run through everything from before, powered by sheer momentum and harmonic ingenuity, in eventually returning to the home key. As orchestrators, we have to join in this game by also playing around with colors, contrasts, and dramatic proportions in order to keep the energy fresh for the listener. In this case, I set up this restatement with a passage of winds playing around with tuplets before, so now I'm going to resolve that tension by letting them settle together in a sweet, collected declamation, using all the main voices we heard leading up to this point, flutes, oboes, and clarinets. As before with the second restatement, the answering motive is given to the strings, this time fattened up by second bassoon and C basso horns. A little tenor register first bassoon added to the next wind declamation, a bit of F horn joining in with the strings in response, firming up the top line of the chordal melody as the violins are forced to drop out due to range issues. In both cases, modern valve horns, or even my trombones here, would play more secure, even pitches. But since the horns are just adding a bit of strength to the strings, a few stop pitches won't really affect the evenness of timbre all that much. I keep the next motive at the meno in the upper winds, but make them more cool and icy by blending them with upper strings, and then answering them with lusty C basso horns and trombones. And after the page turn, I keep the horns and trombones in leading roles, playing out the inherent melody within the piano score's right-hand tuplets as a warm, full-throated chorale, which, coming from within the already established scoring of this passage from its previous appearances, transposed down a perfect fifth, supplies a whole new color, sensibility, and urgency. The alto trombone really pulls its weight here in firming up the top of that line in collaboration with the first horn for a very clear, intense tone, while any stop pitches just add a little bite to the cushion of string and wind scoring. Other than that, there's not much else to say except how much I liked scoring the F mediant of the D flat seventh chord on timpani there near the end, resolving to a root C in the tutti chord. Just as I kept the trading off tuplets to the strings in the first section of the rondo, I'm keeping them in the winds in this middle part, wending their way downwards through oboe and clarinet to clarinet and bassoon. I love the contrast of timbre between chalamo clarinet and tenor register bassoon. The tone can end up so light at the piano dynamic that the sudden reappearance of the upward ripping arpeggios will fall like a hammer blow. Just as Beethoven was happy to transpose his entire piano score up a minor third here, so am I with my orchestral score. Except that I alternate those worrying bars onto staccato dancing upper strings instead of bubbling winds. Beethoven is trying to find his way home through his established material with alterations of expectation and harmonic direction and occasionally misdirection. 
I'm trying to find my way home to the original treatment of the opening theme. So I keep those strings strong in the picture going into the next page, and make the winds the contrasting element. Though this time, due to range as much as variation of timbre, I score the interlocking pattern in flutes instead of clarinets, with bassoons holding down the bass. And yet, just as before, I have the strings come in under the second wind entrance, pushing feverishly toward the coming tutti chord. The energy of the strings and the placement of the wind pitches are so opportune that no brass scoring is needed whatsoever. The funnest part for me was isolating out a wide voicing of that final D-flat 7th chord, holding over from the previous tutti with cello and viola on the outside and clarinets in the middle. From here, I can reintroduce the trading off tuplets for one last passage, starting an interlocking first and second violins, ascending up a couple of octaves as the chord fades out, and then trading off with first flute as the second violins drop out, and then interlocking patterns somewhat with first clarinet. The clarinet doesn't really have to interlock so much, as it's always starting on the beat, so I'm keeping its roll more sparse, so that when the first violins give over their roll to the alternating flute, the feeling of playful randomness will be more fully apparent even though all will be carefully measured by the players, especially that first flutist coming in on the half beat at the end. Let's listen to this whole section with the score now, and watch for how I evolve the texture in a way that hopefully will bring us back more inevitably to the original scoring for all of Beethoven's inspired horseplay. And so, for the recap, I finally reuse the original orchestration of the opening passage, at least for the first five and a half bars. From there, I leave out the oboes, and just let the bassoons take over, answered by a brief horn chorale, which gives me license on the next page to simply score the little development completely in strings. After so much trading off, blending of sections, and so on, a passage purely in strings feels welcome and authentic to me, so that for the emphasis on those high C's, all I need to add is a little sforzando on flute and oboe, culminating with simple wind and string doubling, answered by all winds an octave lower. Notice that I kept the internal harmony going with some added relevant pitches and middle strings, and gave the lower sforzando C's to the second violins to keep the cellos in a more comfortable register. From strings to a mix with winds, to winds, and then on the next page, a pianissimo brass chord, with a lot of intermingling pitches in order to fine-tune the color. You'll hear in the mock-up that the chord almost sounds like the same winds playing again as in the previous chord, though realistically it will take a very fine first player to get that top A below a mezzo piano. Then the next bar is a combination of all the sections, layered in fairly close scoring with lots of doubling, though I keep the brass below middle C except for the third horn, and most of the strings and winds from middle C upwards, except of course for bassoons and low strings. But I completely do away with the extended arpeggiando sweep across the piano, except for some grace notes in first flute, first oboe, and first and second violins. The chord has enough impact all on its own, especially with the addition of a trill and flute and first violins, not to mention a firm thump from timpani. That simply leaves the last breathless dash to the finish line, with bassoons and cellos in unison on that internal counter melody, doubled and harmonized at the sixth by alto and tenor trombones. Bass trombone and double basses hold down those low Fs, and then both parts come together with a dive downward to the root at the end, with a bit of help from the timpani. The horns add some support of both functions, along with a little harmonic filling in, especially into the final bars, the first horn popping out a high C at the end. 
Note that I've underplayed the dynamic markings a bit here, really letting the strings take the lead if any instrument deserves to. The real focus here should be on the merging of bubbling winds with hammering strings, blending both workarounds that I scored earlier in the movement, clarinets giving over to oboes, giving over to flutes, with those lower instruments filling in harmonically as they drop the melodic roll. Thanks again for joining me as I look through my orchestrations of this year's challenge piece, Beethoven's 24th Piano Sonata. Even though I feel I got both movements into a presentable form, I'm still seeing a lot of little fixes and adjustments I'd probably make before sending it to the orchestra librarian, if indeed any orchestra would want to play it. Not that there'd be any problem with the score, but more that it might be hard to talk an orchestra into programming a work like this as more than a curiosity rather than a bit of solid, repeatable repertoire that would be accepted enough into the canon to represent a dependable audience. Probably, if so, <clears throat> the second movement might end up being played a bit slower than I've scored here to keep everyone firmly on track, and thus the incredible excitement and sense of recklessness might be lost. And that would be a pity even though I say that, fully aware that it would take most orchestras a bit of serious woodshedding to get it up to 144 beats per minute. But all that aside, I can now relinquish my role as orchestrator and lecturer for this challenge, and take on the task of orchestration coach. I am really looking forward to evaluating all your scores. Who knows how many I'll get this year. We'll see in the next video release for today, the 2023 Orchestration Challenge Evaluations Guide. Stay tuned for that, and watch for the first evaluations videos to drop starting tomorrow.